This is Space Time, Series 27, Episode 113, for broadcast on the 18th of September, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, recent volcanism discovered on the Moon, the strange phenomena people are likely to see when they finally walk on the Moon's South Pole, and a new crew arrives aboard the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have discovered evidence of volcanism on the lunar surface as recently as 125 million years ago. The findings, reported in the journal Science, suggest the moon was volcanically active for far longer than previously thought, with volcanoes erupting as recently as when dinosaurs were walking on Earth. There's extensive geological evidence of ancient volcanic activity on the moon, but exactly how long this volcanism persisted has been unclear until now. The new evidence is based on radioisotope dating of three volcanic glass beads which were found in lunar soils collected by the Chang'e 5 sample return mission. The dating of lunar volcanic basalt samples returned to Earth by both the American Apollo and Soviet Union lunar missions or delivered to Earth as lunar meteorites have already shown that lunar basaltic volcanism continued until at least 2.9 to 2.8 billion years ago. Earlier analysis of lunar samples returned by China's Chang'e 5 mission had already demonstrated that basaltic volcanism still persisted on the moon until at least 2 billion years ago. Remote sensing observations had indicated potentially even younger volcanism, possibly dating to the Copernican era less than 800 million years ago. Eruptions of gas-rich magma can generate magma fountains, and these produce submillimeter-sized glass beads. These beads could potentially be deposited over a fairly wide area and subsequently be transported even further away across the lunar surface by impact events. Researchers with the Institute of Geology and Geophysics at the Chinese Academy of Sciences identified three volcanic glass beads while studying some 3,000 glass beads in lunar soil samples, carefully examining textures and elemental compositions, including their sulfur isotope ratios. The signatures of the three volcanic glass beads differed from those of other glass beads which had been caused by impact events, thus providing a criteria for distinguishing volcanic glasses from impact glasses. The scientists then used uranium lead dating for the three volcanic glass beads, showing that they had formed some 123 million years ago, give or take 15 million years. The findings mean that the radioisotope dating of the three Chang'e 5 volcanic glass beads provides the first definitive evidence of 123 million year old volcanism on the lunar surface. This is space time. Still to come, the strange phenomena people will see when they arrive at the moon's south pole, and a new crew arrives aboard the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on space time. When astronauts return to the Moon's surface as part of the Artemis III mission to the lunar south pole, they'll experience a very different environment to that which the Apollo astronauts witnessed more than half a century ago. Instead of regular periods of day and night with the Earth's blue orb as a constant companion in the velvet black skies, landing near the Moon's south pole will mean a strangely hovering sun and giant shadows. See, near the Moon's South Pole, astronauts will see dramatic shadows that are 25 to 50 times longer than the objects casting them. That's because the Sun's light will strike the lunar surface at a very low angle, hanging just a few degrees above the horizon. As a result, astronauts won't be seeing any sunrises or sunsets. Instead, they'll simply watch it hover near the horizon as it moves horizontally across the sky. Because sunlight at the Moon's south pole skims the surface horizontally, it brushes crater rims but doesn't always reach their floors. Some deep craters haven't seen the light of day for billions of years, so temperatures there could dip to minus 168 degrees Celsius. That's nearly three times colder than the lowest temperatures recorded in Antarctica. At the other extreme, areas in direct sunlight, such as the crater rims, will reach temperatures of more than 55 degrees Celsius. 
And of course, the moon, unlike the Earth, doesn't have a thick atmosphere to scatter blue light. So the daytime sky on the moon will always be black. So astronauts will see a stark contrast between the dark sky and the bright ground. The Artemis moonwalkers will find a rugged landscape that takes skill to traverse. See, the moon has mountains, valleys and canyons just like on Earth. But the most notable feature for astronauts on the surface will be the moon's millions of craters. And near the South Pole, those gaping craters, together with the long shadows, will make it difficult for astronauts to traverse and navigate. However, some other unique features on the Moon will seem more familiar to those who remember the Apollo missions. The first will be lunar dust, known as regolith. It coats the Moon's surface and looks like fine, very soft talcum powder. But looks can be deceiving. See, lunar regolith is formed when meteoroids hit the Moon's surface, melting and shattering rocks into tiny, sharp pieces. Now, because the moon doesn't have any erosion, so to speak, there's no moving water or wind to smooth out these regolith grains, so they simply stay sharp and scratchy, posing a risk to astronauts and their equipment. One of the reasons the Artemis crews will have new spacesuits is because the suits worn by the Apollo astronauts were being damaged by the sharp, dusty lunar surface. And because the moon has no atmosphere to speak of, its surface is exposed to plasma and radiation from the sun. As a result of this, static electricity tends to build up on the surface in exactly the same way as it does when you shuffle your feet against a carpeted floor. Then when you touch something, you transfer that charge by way of a small static electric shock. On Earth, that's annoying, but on the Moon, this transfer could short-circuit electronics. And this talcum powder-like moon dust can also make its way into the astronaut's living quarters. That's because the static electricity causes it to stick to spacesuits. When the Apollo astronauts completed their EVAs on the lunar surface and took off their spacesuits once back in their lunar modules, they all noticed a strange metallic smell. That was the lunar dust. It's the smell of the moon. And it's dangerous, because this dust is so fine it can get into your lungs and airways, and that could cause long-term health problems. So NASA's been developing new methods to keep the dust at bay using resistant textiles, filters and a shield that employs an electric field to remove dust from surfaces. Back in 1972, while doing an EVA on the lunar surface, Apollo 16 astronaut Charles Duke hammered a core sample tube into the moon's surface until it met a rock and wouldn't go any further. Then the hammer flew out of his hand. He made four attempts to pick it up by bending down and leaning to reach for it. He eventually gave up and returned to the rover to get tongs and finally pick up the hammer successfully. And Artemis moonwalkers will face similar challenges. The Apollo crews found it easier to bunny hop or kangaroo hop as they moved across the lunar surface. The Artemis crews will undoubtedly do the same. That's because gravity won't pull them down as forcefully as it does on Earth. See, the Moon's only a quarter the size of the Earth, with six times less gravity. So simple activities like swinging a rock hammer to chip off samples will feel very different. While the hammer will feel lighter to hold, its inertia won't change, leading to a strange sensation for astronauts. Of course, the lower gravity has perks too. Astronauts won't be weighed down by their hefty spacesuits, and apparently bunny hopping across the lunar surface is just plain fun. When the Artemis astronauts look up at the sky from the lunar surface, they'll see their home planet, the Earth, shining back at them. And just like us mere Earthlings see different phases of the Moon throughout a month, astronauts on the Moon will see an ever-shifting Earth. But the Earth's phases will occur opposite to the Moon's. When the Earth experiences a new Moon, a full Earth will be visible from the lunar surface. And finally, because the Moon's smaller than the Earth, its horizon will look shorter and closer. Now, to someone standing on level ground on the Earth's surface, the horizon's about five kilometres away. But to astronauts on the Moon, it'll only be two kilometres away, making their surroundings seem more confined. More from NASA TV. I'm Ernie Wright. I work in the Scientific Visualization Studio at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, a computer model of the view at the South Pole of the Moon. This is like a time lapse to show the motion of the Sun and the Earth and how the shadows change over time. Things don't rise and set in the usual way here. The Sun travels around the horizon, never getting more than a degree and a half above or below it, so there are always long shadows. And from here, the Earth appears to be upside down and rotating backwards, but that's just because of our point of view. 
The Earth doesn't move much in the moon sky. It's always in roughly the same place, just sort of bobbing around. That's true everywhere on the near side of the moon. It's a consequence of the moon always pointing the same face toward Earth. It takes about a month for the sun to make a complete circuit around the horizon, and every so often, it'll pass behind the Earth, creating an eclipse. On Earth, that would be a total lunar eclipse, uh, the moon passing through the shadow cast by the Earth. But if you're standing on the moon, it's an eclipse of the sun. The terrain at the South Pole is especially rugged. The sunlight never reaches the crater floor, so temperatures there are around 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. This model of the terrain is made possible by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has been mapping the surface of the Moon from lunar orbit since 2009. These maps will be incredibly important for exploring the Moon and locating water and other resources there. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new crew arrive on the International Space Station, and later in the Science Report, a new study shows that up to 19% of dementia cases could be linked to vision problems. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The Russian Soyuz MS-26 capsule is successfully docked with the International Space Station just three hours after its launch aboard a Soyuz 21A rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. Countdown clocks are ticking backward for the launch of the Soyuz MS-26 spacecraft atop its Soyuz booster at 11.23 a.m. Central Time, 12.23 p.m. Eastern Time, 9.23 p.m. in Baikonur. We now have engine sequence start. The second umbilical tower is now separate. The engines are at maximum thrust, booster ignition now at full throttle, and we have liftoff of Pettit, Ochinin, and Wagner now on their way to the International Space Station as part of a two orbit journey. We are seeing good vehicle parameter, parameter so far. Vehicle performance is continuing to look good. We are now just over a minute into today's launch. We are seeing good yaw pitch and roll heading downrange. Velocity is over 1,100 miles per hour. Everything continuing to proceed as planned. Just a few seconds, the escape tower will be jettisoned. And we now see first stage separation. The crew members reported they are feeling well and we are having good pitch roll and jaw of the vehicle. We are four minutes and 45 seconds into today's flight. We have about four minutes of powered flight remaining. And we just saw a second stage separation and the third stage has ignited. Everything's okay on board. We feel great. Soyuz is now being propelled by the single engine of the Soyuz third stage. 590 seconds waiting for the separation. And we now have confirmation of third stage separation. The single liquid fueled engine has shut down and has dropped away at an altitude of about 126 miles. And we have confirmation that the solar arrays and antennas have been deployed. The mission carrying two Russian cosmonauts and an American astronaut docked automatically with the space station's Razvet modules Nadir port using Russia's two and a half orbit fast rendezvous flight path. The mission had been delayed since March, when an automated warning system halted the launch after detecting a voltage drop in the power system. The new crew will remain on station as part of the Expedition 7172 mission until March 2025. This is Space Time. Time now for another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study has found that between 5 and 19% of dementia cases in the United States could be linked to vision problems. 
The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association means treatment and prevention for those vision problems also has the potential to reduce dementia rates. Previous research had already identified that vision impairment could be a modifiable risk factor for dementia. So the authors of this new study use data from 2,767 older adults participating in the long-term health study to calculate how many dementia cases within that group could be linked back to a vision impairment. They found that up to 19% of dementia cases within the group could be attributed to at least one vision impairment, with contrast sensitivity issues most strongly linked to dementia. Now, the researchers admit their study can't prove that vision issues cause dementia in their participants. But it is possible that if you could prevent these vision problems from occurring in the first place, fewer people would go on to develop dementia. A new global inventory of plastic pollution has shown that over 52 million tonnes of plastic is dumped into the environment every year. And it's mostly occurring through littering in richer countries and uncollected waste in less wealthy ones. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, modelled macroplastic pollution in more than 50,000 cities where plastic enters the environment rather than being contained in waste management systems. They found that although low- and middle-income countries generated much less plastic per person per day, as low as a fifth of some high-income countries, more of it was left uncollected or went into uncontrolled dumps, resulting in a far higher level of plastic pollution. The authors say their work could inform negotiations on the UN Plastics Treaty, which should include both minimisation of plastic at the source and improved waste management collection. A new study warns that trusted but incorrect machine learning information is entering human conversations, and it's all thanks to the rise of artificial intelligence large language models. A report in the journal of the Royal Society Open Science points out that the legal protection against this is unclear. Oxford University researchers found that truth-related legal obligations often don't apply to the private sector and usually cover platforms or people, not hybrids such as chatbots. To fill this gap, they're proposing a new broad legal requirement that large language model providers minimise careless speech and avoid centralised private control of the truth. They can do this through transparency and public involvement and probably also by getting rid of their work programmers. Apple's released its new iPhone 16, but are the changes really worth it? With the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex of royd from techadvice.life. We have the iPhone 16 and 16 Pro and obviously have things like better cameras, more battery life, but really the big change is the introduction of AI. Now, although Samsung and Google have launched their new phones with AI features ready to go and working straight away. Apple's AI features will take the next few months to arrive. Now, in October, there will be an 18.1 update to iOS and iPadOS, which will bring in the sort of writing tools to help you rewrite information and create images that we've seen with ChatGPT. But this will be on device, but it will only be available for the iPhone 16 range, Pro or non-Pro, and for the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max. So older devices will not get this. Whereas with Google, any Android device can download Google Gemini which is their version of ChatGPT. So a lot of people that don't want to spend top dollar on a brand new phone will probably find the Android side of things more attractive because they can upgrade their existing phones to use the AI. Nevertheless, there's obviously those improvements which are going to be of greatest interest to those who have an iPhone that is several years old. The days of getting whiz-bang incredible updates year on year are no longer there despite the fact that the companies like to say that, well, our improved chip and improved battery life is worth a year-on-year change. Most people People keep their phones for several years. There is a new physical camera button that you can press and half press and slide your finger across to change from the different camera zoom lengths and change depth of field. For those who are really into their cameras, that will be a good reason to upgrade. For other people who just want a phone to make phone calls and use basic apps, they're going to look at those new devices and think, well, maybe I'll wait a bit longer. Now, we also have the new AirPods, AirPods version 4, been redesigned to have longer battery life, but there's a second version of the AirPods 4 that has noise cancellation without needing the little silicon tips. Some people thought there might be an AirPods Pro 3, there isn't. 
the AirPods Pro 2 will be upgraded within the next couple of months to be a full hearing aid medical clinical grade device. So unusually, you will not have to buy a whole new Apple device to get these features. Anyone with existing AirPods Pro 2 will be able to uh, switch on this hearing aid for medium to mild hearing loss. And there's no Apple Watch Ultra 3, but the Apple Watch Ultra 2 will get this ability to detect sleep apnea once the authority from the uh, medical authorities comes through in the next month or two. And the new Apple Watch Series 10 is thinner. It's the thinnest Apple Watch yet. Obviously, it's not as thin as one of those super thin swatches, but it is thinner than before. And it also has this new sleep apnea feature. We don't have the blood glucose uh, monitoring yet. We don't have the ability to check your uh, blood pressure yet. We see some of those features like blood pressure on other watches. That's coming in the future. But a very nice series of upgrades from Apple with a lot of the AI features yet to come both next month and over the course of the next year. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from techadvice.life. the show for now space time is available every monday wednesday and friday through apple podcasts itunes stitcher google podcast pocket casts spotify acast amazon music bytes.com soundcloud youtube your favorite podcast download provider and from space time with stuart gary.com space time's also broadcast through the national science foundation on science zone radio and on both iheart radio and tune in radio And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetime with stuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 